So let's talk about this promise uh, about what President Trump said this bill would be. He, he seemed to have been very clear. To the Washington Post in January, he said, quote, we are going to have insurance for everybody. And he told CBS the following during the campaign. Take a listen. Universal health care. I am going to take care of everybody. I'm, I don't care if it costs me votes or not. Who pays for it? The government's going to pay for it, but we're going to save so much money on the other side. Now, Dr. Price, I know I don't need to tell you there's no study of this bill that suggests it will provide insurance for every American. In fact, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, and I know some have issues with it, but they say 24 million fewer Americans will have health insurance under the plan. Given that the fact that, that the president promised insurance for everyone, how do you justify to the millions of voters who believe President Trump that there would be insurance for everyone when there clearly is not going to be? Well, the president is committed to that, as am I and those of us at the Department of Health and Human Services. The fact of the matter is this bill that's moving through Congress right now is simply the first step in this process. Uh, the three steps include not just this bill, but the administrative changes that we're able to put in place at the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, all those regulations and rules that were put forward by the previous administration, many harmed patients and drove up costs. We're going to look at every one of them and make certain that we have those in place that actually help patients and drive down costs uh, or and if they hurt patients and drive up costs we're going to do away with them and then the the third bucket the third part of all of this are the other pieces of legislation that are we're moving through Congress literally as we speak so the plan in its entirety is the one that the president uh, ha has assured the American people every single American will have access to affordable coverage that works for them not for government and that's what we have in mind well with, with all due respect sir there is a difference between access to insurance and insurance, and there will be, according to the CBO projection and others, millions of Americans who will not be able to afford insurance, who will not have it anymore. So when you talk about their, the goal being everyone having insurance, and President Trump was very clear that if they couldn't afford it, the government would pay for it, are you talking about after the three steps, or are you talking about even longer down the road? Well, again, remember what the Congressional Budget Office looked at was simply this first piece of legislation, which is not the plan in its entirety. Uh, imagine, if you will, a system that actually drives down costs of health coverage for individuals. That's the one that we envision. Imagine, if you will, a system that actually provides patients with an array of options, something that works for them. Not that the government dictates to them that they must purchase, but something that works for them so they can see the doctor that they want to see, they can see the health care provider that they want to see, they can go to the hospital that they want to go to. Those are the kinds of new things in a plan that we envision, and parts one, two, and three will accomplish all of that. That's what the president's talking about. So just to, just to put a button on this, you're saying that after the third part of this has passed and the president has signed it into law and time has gone on so that it's been implemented, every American will have insurance. There will be universal coverage. Every American will have access to the kind of coverage that they want. Remember what the president talked about in his, in his uh, joint session? He said that we've got to make certain that those with pre-existing illness and, and injury are, are covered. We need to make certain that we provide the states the kind of flexibility that they need to fashion their Medicaid program for their vulnerable population in a way that actually works for patients, to make certain that we add tax credits for folks so that every single American has the financial feasibility to purchase coverage, to address the purchase across state lines, to make certain that we're driving down uh, drug costs, uh, to make certain that we address the lawsuit abuse that exists in our country in the area of health care that drives up the cost for so many individuals. So the plan in its entirety is one that we believe will be, will be strong, will be efficient, will make it so that every single American has access to the kind of coverage that they want, not that the government forces them to buy. Right, and I, I get the idea of access, but the president didn't say everyone would have access to insurance. He said everyone would have insurance. One of the reasons that the CBO projects there will be so many uninsured is because this bill would end the Obamacare Medicaid expansion that provided insurance to 11 million Americans. During his speech to the joint session of Congress, President Trump had this to say about Medicaid. Take a listen. We should give our state governors the resources and flexibility they need with Medicaid to make sure no one is left out. No one is left out, but there are four Republican governors, as I'm sure you know, Kasich, Snyder, Sandoval, and Hutchinson, that say that this bill does not live up to the principles enumerated by President Trump. They wrote to the Republican congressional leaders saying, quote, the current version of the House bill does not meet this test. It provides almost new flexibility, no new flexibility for states, does not ensure the resources necessary to make sure no one is left out, and shifts significant new costs to states. So, Mr. Secretary, 
These are Republican governors that are objecting to your plan, saying that you're going to be leaving people out. It's not just a question of access. A lot of Americans are going to be left behind because the Medicaid expansion will be ended and there are fewer resources that will go their way. What is your message to these Republican governors? Well, I hate to sound like a broken record, but what they're looking at is not the plan. What they're looking at is this first piece of legislation. And as you and they know, you can't put the kind of flexibility that's necessary for them to be able to fashion their program for their vulnerable population in the way that they see fit in the first piece of legislation, which is why it's this three phase or three part or three legs of a stool plan. And we've talked to, I've, I've talked to countless governors, uh, in, including uh, the four that signed that letter, and, and talked about the kind of flexibility that they want and they desire to make certain that they're able to, to put in place a plan that cares for their vulnerable population. They're incredibly supportive of the kinds of things that we're talking about in that administrative phase and in the third phase where we actually are able to get to some of the insurance reforms that you can't get to because of the rules of the Senate in the first. At the end of the day, this isn't about just the process that we go through here in Washington. This is about whether or not the American people are going to get the health care that they need. Right now, many of them have health coverage. They've got an insurance card, but they aren't getting the care that they need because of the premiums that are increased, because the deductibles are up that they can't afford. We've got a third of the counties in this nation that only have one, one insurance provider on the exchange. Five states only have one insurance provider. That's not a program that's working for the American people. May work for government, may work for insurance, but it does doesn't work for people. And that's what our goal is, is to put in place a system that actually works for the American people. But one of the things that critics are saying, including Republican critics, is that, first of all, premiums are going to go down for younger Americans, yes, under your plan, but they're going to go up significantly for Americans between the ages of 50 and 64, and that might price some of them out of the market, and they're not going to get the same kind of compensation from the government uh, in terms of the refundable tax credits that they were getting from the Obamacare uh, stipends that they were being given. Um, and then in terms of the Medicaid expansion, these governors are saying, you're going to be taking away the money that we need for this Medicaid expansion. So when you say that more Americans are going to have access to health insurance, that's not going to mean much to these people who can't afford it. This is, this is really an important point because we, we, we need to stop in Washington measuring the success of programs by how much money we're putting into it. Imagine a Medicaid system that actually works better for patients, provides higher services for patients, is more tailored to the patients that are actually using it, and costs less. That's the kind of system that, that, that we envision because it's actually possible if you put in place the kind of flexibilities and, and improvements in a program, again, that allows states to determine how best to care for that vulnerable population. This is a really an important point because this isn't, this isn't just this first uh, piece of legislation. If you look at the plan in its entirety, it's one that will work better for states, better for patients, better for the doctors trying to provide the care. There are a lot of physicians out there and a lot of other providers that have looked at the, the current system and said, I can't care for my patients in the way that we believe to be most appropriate because of the rules and regulations and because of the stipulations and because of the cost that's, that's been injected into the program. So imagine, if you will, a system that actually puts patients at the center of it as opposed to insurance companies or, or the government. Uh, that's a system that we believe we can put in place, one that will work, a transition over a period of time to make sure that nobody falls through the cracks. That's the kind of plan that we believe will work for the American people. Well, it sounds utopian, but I have to say you criticize the Medicaid program because one in three doctors don't take Medicaid patients. Um, and then you talk about, but the reason that they don't, according to experts, is because the reimbursement rate is so low. I don't know how you're going to improve Medicaid if you're taking money away from Medicaid. The problem is that doctors are not getting paid enough and you're saying okay but we're going to do better with less money and i don't know an economist who thinks that's going to work every time you, t you 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 peel back that onion a little bit you drill down and you look at it specifically you can see where there are wonderful opportunities for improvement in the system the medicaid program actually covers four different groups in our population uh, seniors uh, disabled healthy moms and kids. And yet what the federal government says to the states is you must treat those healthy moms and kids. You must have a plan for those healthy moms and kids that's exactly the same as the seniors and the disabled. That doesn't make sense to anybody who's looking at this, not just healthcare economists or individuals who are experts on financing and delivery of healthcare, but the common American uh, ordinary people say, well, that doesn't make any sense if you're caring for moms and kids in the same way you're caring for disabled and, and, and the aged. So 
think about, imagine a system, if you will, that actually responds to the needs of those healthy moms and kids in a much more flexible and, and responsive manner. You can save huge amounts of money so that you've got greater resources to care for those who are aged and disabled. Dr. Tom Price, we appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jake.